our relationship is both friendly, but it's kind of an informal coaching situation as well. How does that help you to be uh, accountable to somebody? Because you're accountable to your uh, riding buddy. Uh, you're accountable to uh, Mr. Snuggles because you've got to get up and feed him. How does it help you to be accountable to people? Because you seem to have sourced out some people to mm. make you accountable. Um, I'm not sure whether I go down this route particularly because I do live alone or whether it's my nature that I need um, support and encouragement. Um, and I'm so glad I do have people like yourself, Bill, because you are specially chosen, I'll tell you, because you've been through all this stroke nonsense. I don't think I could be coached by someone who really, really didn't get it. This is Recovery After Stroke with Bill Gassiamis, helping you go from where you are to where you'd rather be. Bill from recoveryafterstroke.com. This is episode 92, and my guest today is Claire Caulfield. Claire is a hemorrhagic stroke survivor, a friend, and someone that I am coaching and gently keeping accountable. At 69 years young, Claire is full of enthusiasm and passion for her recovery and has overcome some huge challenges, including breaking her foot just as she began to walk again. Claire Caulfield, welcome to the podcast. No, oh, thank you, Bill. Lovely to be here. You know, we've done a podcast before. Do you remember? Oh, I can't remember what it was about or when it was. It was about stroke recovery and it was episode 10 and it was in 2017. Oh, right. Years ago. <laughs> I don't remember that. I must look that up because it'd be interesting to see what changes there have been. So 2017, my goodness. Yeah, I'll send you the link. Stroke, oh, thank you. it was called Stroke Recovery with Claire Caulfield. Oh, great. I'll enjoy watching that. <laughs> so um, it's time for another episode, uh, uh, episode 90-something or other we're going to have. Wow. And, um, there's been quite a few since the, first, the, the one that we did together way back in episode 10, and mm. you've come a long way. When was your stroke? How long ago was it? Um, 21st of October, 2015. And can you remember a little bit about what happened to you? Sure can. <laughs> um, I was very excited being at my friend's house, Nikki Ellis, who lives locally here in um, McLeod. And she'd filled the room and I'd filled the room with ladies who wanted to know about goal setting. And I was fighting fit. I was so excited about doing this presentation. And at one point, I lost my place, what I was talking about, which, is, which was unusual for me. And her daughter, the lady's daughter, had my notes and she held them up for me. And I'm looking at the notes and I'm thinking, I can't read that. I don't know what that is. <laughs> so my daughter-in-law came forward and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Claire, I think you better sit down. And I said, no, ah, I'm fine. I'll just finish this. We've only got another 20 minutes to go. She said, Claire, I really think you should sit down. So I said, oh, right, okay then. So I got her to put a chair so I could still keep talking, yeah? And as I sat, sat down, my whole right side just completely collapsed in front of everybody. <laughs> Not that that was an issue, but it was a shock for them. My goodness. And I hadn't a clue what was going on. Um, and before I knew it, I looked at Jo. She's on her phone. There's an ambulance at the door. And boom, I'm straight into the Austin. So I would say she literally saved my life with her quick response and recognising the signs um, because I'd, I'd never anticipated having a stroke. <laughs> I thought that was for the men in my family. So my father and my eldest brother had had a stroke, but they were both big drinkers, big smokers, overweight, 
And I wasn't any of those things, although I have always liked my white wine. Um, but comparing myself to them health-wise, I thought, oh, it's not an issue for me. Absolutely not. So for me to have a stroke was a real um, shock because um, I thought I looked after myself pretty well. But what I didn't realise until afterwards was that it was actually a brain hemorrhage. Um, so not a blood clot here, it was a brain hemorrhage and it just went... Um, made a big fuss and literally knocked me out. Um, so unbeknownst to me, um, my daughter-in-law's on the phone to her husband, who's my son, saying, you better come quick to the Austin your mum's had a stroke. What? My mum? You're kidding me. Right, okay. So he came in and his face was grey. I'll never forget it. He was in such shock because uh, he just thought the two of us had gone out for a, a fun evening together. Yeah, okay. That's what it was meant to be. What well, was meant to be, yeah. So more than two months later before I got home, and that was just a whole incredible story. But, but that particular night is emblazoned on my memory from the, the anticipation, the feeling, excitement of this great, well, I wanted to do it, a great event. Um, and then before I knew it, I literally couldn't move on my right side and I was in hospital not knowing what was going on. So, not what I expected to happen when I went out that night. Yeah. So, your stroke was a, a, a hemorrhagic stroke. What were some of the things that you had to recover from after the stroke? What were some of the deficits that it left you? Um, the paralysis down my right side. So, it's left side stroke, um, hemorrhage, right side paralysis. Um, and really, I could lift my right arm and it just flopped down like a doll's, a floppy doll's. So I had no control over my right leg or my right arm. Um, I felt as though um, there was a zipper down the middle of my body. My left hand side was working perfectly fine, thank you. And the right side had given up and just said, I'm not playing anymore. So my two halves of my body went talking to each other. Yeah. And that was so confusing. Um, I had no feeling in my hand or my arm or my leg. It was totally numb and what I would have said useless. And that, that was really frightening because I didn't understand about stroke. I hadn't learned anything about stroke. It was completely new. So I was learning as I went on. Um, but what I somehow instinctively the first thing that I wanted to do for myself was to um, lift my arm and kiss it like this. Yeah. Because I thought, looking down this ward, there are guys here waving their sticks in the air, shouting and screaming at the staff. There are other people so angry they are hitting that affected sites and swearing like troopers. And I thought, oh my God, I'm not do I can't do that to my body. I just can't. So I started all this. Well, what what would I what would I say to my granddaughters? Because they were quite little at the time. So I would say, come on, darling, you're gonna be okay. You'll be all right. Um, have some kisses and cuddles with grandma. So I was treating my arm like a granddaughter. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Um, so being ultra kind and gentle to myself. So I really believe that that mindset of directing my language about myself to myself was vital in my recovery. Now, we're, we're all different. So that might not work for other people. But for me, I felt that I was taking a modicum of control to... See what happened. I didn't know whether it would help me recover or not, but it seemed to me instinctive 
that it was a kind thing to do for myself. I remember you had a conversation with somebody who uh, spoke to your arm in a way that you didn't agree with. Oh, this is where the feisty, feisty Scotswoman comes out. So it was actually, I think it was my leg, one of the physiotherapists um, who were, in general, tremendous people. There was one, I think, maybe because she was a lot older than the other ones, and she had her absolutely her own way of doing this. Um, she would say to me, as I was trying to learn to go up and down stairs again, which was terrifying, because the stairs in the hospital are massive. And you think, oh, what does she want me to go up these stairs for? I'm going to fall down. Um, so it was terrifying. Um, but what she would say to me was, Claire, use your right leg to go up to heaven and your left leg to go down to hell. Oh, Oh dear, so I remember going, excuse me, <laughs> can we can we just take a little break here? I need to tell you something. And she's saying, what? What, what? what is it? What's the matter? And I said, look, I've had a Catholic upbringing, which I didn't enjoy. And all this talk of heaven and hell really does not sit well with me. Can we please change the language because this is not working for me at all? So I think that was the end of the session at that point. Oh, time, time's up. Right, okay. <laughs> so God knows what she said in the staff room. Um, but I thought, I'm not taking that language. I'm, uh, as they say these days, I'm not wearing it. I'm not. Heaven and hell, good and bad. Oh, I don't, nothing to do with having a stroke. And stroke recovery nonsense so I so I watched what language I was using to myself and then about myself and what language I would accept from other people so your what kind of language would you use what is the, the what was the right way to speak about your hand or your leg for you instead of the words that she used um, Okay, um, I thought about this one, and there's so many different words we could use. We could use for, for the side that was damaged, we could use affected sites and your non affected sites, but not good and bad or bad and good. Um, and for my leg, I said to her, um, The left one is the one that's working well, and the right one, the affected leg, is the learning leg. It's learning to walk again. Yeah. So we wouldn't say to children, oh, come on, you know, you're going to go to hell or, you know, <laughs> your leg's going to hell or up to hell. You, wouldn't, you just wouldn't do it. So I thought, no, it's a learning leg, and it has that has done me well. It's learned very well indeed. Um. For me, that was vital that I stuck to my my principles on that, yeah. because you don't have much control when you're in hospital. In fact, I don't think you've got any really. When you think about the the foods and you know people waking you up at all sorts of crazy times and telling you to go to sleep when you don't want to, and I mean the care was excellent. I know that, mm. but I wanted to be treated as an individual which is very difficult for the staff to do when you're in that, you know, a communal ward situation. Yeah. Um, but I'm going through it on my own. I want to do things my way, so. Yeah. Well, that's not a bad thing. You're recently, when we got together, uh, it was probably a couple of months ago, we got together, we spoke about various things. And one of the things you spoke about was your walking aid and that you were about to, Get rid of it for good. Have you managed to get there yet? If you've had a stroke and are in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind, like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, 
But obviously, because you've never had a stroke before, you probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called Seven Questions to Ask Your Doctor About Your Stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Um, I'm not using it as much. So it's a, um, a four wheel drive walker, <laughs> walking frame. Um, I use my stick more which is good, so it's veering towards using the stick more. Unless I'm going to the shops and I need to buy something, the walker's wonderful for putting shopping in it. Uh -huh. So um, if I'm just going out for a walk, um, walk around the block or go down to the park, I'll take my stick and just have lots of breaks because um, there's, no, there's no rush, you know. Um, there's, no, there's no time scales I can do and decide what I want really. Um, so I haven't got rid of the, the walking frame yet, but that's that's on the cards, I think. Yeah. The stronger my leg gets, and just I don't know if these things are coincidences, but in the local chemist here in McLeod, a um, couple of weeks ago, I saw a pedal machine, just a small one, in the chemist, and I thought. That's unusual. I'll have that. Now, I haven't tried it yet, <laughs> but because I can't go to the gym now, I'll be using that to do some exercise. It's not a bike. It's just a little pedal thing. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't expensive. It was um, really very reasonable. And the, the chemist here even delivered it for me, which was fantastic of them. Um, so there are other ways to do things. So you were using the walker and you found, when we spoke recently, you found that it was potentially interfering with strengthening your leg further. And you, you said to me something along the lines of the way that it makes you walk also changes your posture. Yes. So is that one of the reasons why you decided to start using it less? Yes. Yes. I was finding that I was... Um, I was using a lot of energy in my shoulders and my arms, and that was um, propelling me along the roads. And I wasn't thinking so much about my legs. So my arms are already quite strong, and I was forgetting about building the legs up. So I thought, well, I'm becoming too reliant on leaning on this frame, and I'm neglecting my legs. So that was one reasoning behind it. So tell me about fatigue. How is how is that coming along? Because you were fatigued for quite a while and you were experiencing fatigue at different times of the day. Has mm. that started to settle down as well? Is it causing less of a disruption or is it still a bit of an issue? Um, I don't worry about it, basically. Um, I mean, I'm pretty well in lockdown here. So... Um, so up until lockdown, though, before lockdown, yeah. we'll talk about that in a minute. What, how was the fatigue changing for you in your recovery? I had to be very careful about my um, timing of going to bed. Um, I've got this habit of staying up and watching movies till two in the morning, and then guess what? I can't get up in the morning, you know. Um, so. Um, allowing myself one film a day during the day <laughs> at the moment. Um, and there's loads, there's loads on Netflix. I mean, you, you couldn't watch all the films on there. Um, and you can watch that anytime you want. Um, I watch the odds program on TV, mostly the news and things like that. Um, but I'm limiting my TV time and I'm not watching TV late at night. Um, 
So trying to get to bed before 11. Wow. That's great because you were going to bed at 2 o'clock. And I remember yeah. saying that you need to start pegging that back. Yeah. So you've done really well. Yeah. I've gradually pulled it back, pulled it back. Um, so that's, that's helping because I, I need to, I want to feel that I'm having a more normal day if there is such a thing now. Yeah. Um, because there were some days at, at the beginning of the, the lockdown, I didn't know what day it was. <laughs> um, but I've got um, a Google Home machine. And all I have to say is, okay, Google, what day is it? And she says, it's Sunday, the 22nd of March, 2020. <laughs> Did you hear it? Yeah. I've got one in the kitchen. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, Google, stop. Thank you. And I've got one in my bedroom, which my son put in for me and set it all up. He said it was easy to set up, but he always says these things are easy. Yeah. Um. So I can lie in bed not having a clue what time it is and say, okay, Google, what time is it? And she'll tell me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so when I begin to have conversations, because if I say thank you quickly enough, she'll say, that's my job. That's what I've been designed to do. <laughs> <laughs> or you're welcome or something crazy. So I'm actually having a, a conversation with this machine which is quite funny, really. Um, yeah. So, so um, pegging back your, your sleep time, you've got it back to before 11 o'clock, which yeah. means that your sleep is actually becoming a really important part of your recovery. It's helping your brain heal. It's helping it detoxify, and it's helping you wake up refreshed in the morning. So what time roughly do you get up now? About nine. Excellent. Yeah, or 10. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> I mean, I wake up and say to Google, uh, you know, please play me a, um, ABC Radio Melbourne or BBC Radio 4 Extra. And I'm very keen on radio plays and BBC Radio 4 Extra. They've just got plays on all day, all night. It's fabulous. Um, and there's great programs on ABC as well. So... It's quite a nice way to start your day, listening to a half hour program or so on, and then I then I get up. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> so then you get up and then you go about your day. And who do you have to feed first? My cat. <laughs> <laughs> tell me about your cat, and and tell me about your cat because we really need to talk about how important he is in yeah. this this part of your recovery. Tell me about your cat. How did you come about having a cat? Okay. Um, well, last year, maybe about May or June, I said to my son that I would really love a dog. So, as always, when I suggest things to my son, he goes away and talks to his wife about it and then comes back with a better plan. <laughs> so, when I think about it, a cat is much better for me. It will not be tripping me up because I'm out walking it with a lead and all of that. So yeah. um, so we went to a pet rescue place in Greensboro and we saw this litter of kittens. Oh, we wanted all of them. The grandkids came with us and we were all going, oh, look at that one, oh, no, look at that one. And so his name at the catchery was Roger. And I thought, I don't think so. <laughs> this sounds like a cat's name to me. Come on. So anyway, we brought him home and oh, thrilled to bits. And when the kids first came over to play with him, they named him Mr. Snuggles because he's a very affectionate cat. He snuggles into you and he, you know, comes up to you and he wants to be friends and wants to play. And so I've had him now since last. In June, and thank goodness I got him because he's been the best little companion you could ever have. Um, he sleeps on top of my bed at night, and I can feel the weight of him on top of the covers. 
And sometimes he'll wake up in the middle of the night and he'll come right up on my pillow and then he'll, he'll come down and lie right across my neck. <laughs> I'm what are you doing? And then he starts going yum, 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 yum into my, into my shoulder. But then I've got a nice fluffy top on. And he's going, nom, 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 nom. and I think it's hilarious. He gives me so many laughs. Um, so obviously he's the first one to get fed in the house. Um, and oh yes, and my son bought him, bought for me my my um, birthday in February. He bought me an emporium. I think that's what it's called for the cat. So it's a little. Um, door in my um, utility room now at his height and he puts his little paws and head in and he goes out and it's a big cage thing that's got toys and different shells for him to jump on and he can see the birdies but can't get them and so he's been loving that and it, just watching him is better than the television it's just so funny um, and then he comes in and out all day long and at night time he likes to go out when it's dark and I think Fair enough, off you go, see you later. Um, so he's got a real character. He's, he's just wonderful. Yeah. Um, and I just love him to bits, I really do. I'm so glad he's here. What does he offer you other than laughs and somebody to feed before you? What else does he offer? Well, his, his little body's very warm. So when he, when he lies, when he comes down off my shoulder, He'll lie this way sometimes, and he's, you can hear his little heart going and his warm body. He's a black and white cat, short-haired cat, and you just feel the warmth of him, and I'm cuddling him, and I'm sure he's cuddling me. I'm absolutely convinced of it. At least that's what I want to think. And that closeness, that physical closeness for me is just adorable. It's just very, very comforting for me. Yeah, well, that, that's excellent because you've never had animals before. You never thought that they were worth having, did you? <laughs> I just always saw them as extra work. And when I was working, I thought, oh, don't, you know, I'm not going to do that as well. But um, just something last year. Oh, I know what it was that prompted me. It was um, I got to my birthday in February last year. Or was it this year? Hold on. Must have been this year. Anyway, I got to 69 and I thought, right, what of all the things that I've started and I haven't finished are all the things that I've always been interested in but never followed up? Wouldn't it be great to have a list of things for my last year of my 60s and to say, hey, look, I can learn new things. Um, I'm enjoying doing new things. I can complete tasks. Um, now I'll make you laugh there was one I've been watching a lot of uh, YouTube videos and I was drying up my pots and pans today <clears throat> and I turned over the frying pan and it was so dark and murky right with grease and all the rest of it and I thought I've seen a YouTube video where you smear the base of the frying pan with toothpaste and then you get a soft cloth and you just rub it off and voila, it's so shiny. So I rubbed mine all off and I went, Matter, it's exactly the same as it was before. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I'm thinking, was it toothpaste he said to put on this or what was it? So I need to go back and look at the video again. God knows what it was, but it, I don't think it was meant to be toothpaste. <laughs> So that, that gave me a huge hoot. Um, I thought, well, I've got less toothpaste now than that. And I've still got a mucky frying pan. So there you go. So what about your list? What about your list of stuff to do for your 69th year? What are the things that you have to finish that you, you neglected for some time? Okay, so I've made a list. So I started knitting socks in the round so that's four needles which I hadn't done since I was at school and then like me I got fed up doing it and they are beautiful she's got two half socks 
in a beautiful blue colour. So they need to be finished. So that's one thing. I've got uh, needlework on a canvas. That's about a third done. And that looks lovely, not finished. Um, my study room is piled high in files and papers from all the past jobs that I've done. And I've never cleared it all out. So I hired a bin from a shredding company and it's on my front porch now. And I, it's about three quarters full, so I've got rid of a lot of stuff. But I look in the room and it's still a mess. So there's lots more to go in that bin. So they'll come and take the bin away and shred it all, which is great. Um, do, do, do. Oh, yes. Um, that lady that Don I'm knitting the socks for, she's a lady who travels around the world in a um, um, tall ship. What do you call it? A yacht. Yes, thank you. She's got a crew, so she's not she's not on her own, um, but she does a lot of the the hard work, the physical work. So she's the one I'm knitting the socks for, and she's a published um, author. So I've engaged her to push me through the next seven weeks until I've finished my manuscript. I've done quite well. I think I've done quite a lot, but it's not enough for a book yet. So we've had one session on Zoom and we're doing another one tomorrow. So I'm feeling well supported with that because left to me, I would do a little bit, put it down, do a little bit, think, oh, who's going to read it anyway? And she's saying, no, madam, just behave yourself. <laughs> um, so that's good. Um, uh, That'll keep me going if I get through all those things yeah. in 2020. I think I'll I'll be doing okay. I think that's plenty as well. You don't want to give yourself too many things to do, then no. you might get overwhelmed. But if you do those slowly, slowly, you'll get to the point where they're done. However, you had to put them off for a little while for legitimate reasons, really. Yeah. Well, sure. And the thing is that with the stroke, I was doing pretty well up until I can't remember 20. 16 and then I broke my foot on the same side that I'd had the stroke and that I just went I went diving down because I'd worked so hard I put all my energy into my recovery and then when I all I did was walk across the road and I twisted my ankle but it actually broke at all and that was me in a gum boot for or a moon boot whatever you call it for eight weeks and they're saying now you do realize because you're older it'll take you longer to for the bones to oh don't don't tell me that please don't tell me that yeah um so two months my mood and my motivation went boom gone yeah so it was a setback so, wasn't it oh it was it was much bigger than well she broke a toe so what but it was after the stroke the hard work recovery, beginning to go out and enjoy myself. I was actually out on a date that night. Yep. <laughs> Never saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we were just crossing the road and my, my foot just went. Yeah. So that, that has set me back quite a bit, but I'm, I'm much, much better. I'm much stronger now than I was. So I don't see it as lost time. I just think that's what it is. Yeah. Whatever you get, you just have to deal with it and find a way to keep going, not to give up, but to keep going and still have that hope that if I take advice and I do the right things, I might get another bit of recovery or I might not, but yeah. it's definitely worth finding out. Yeah. Now, I also remember that you maybe inadvertently kind of isolated yourself a little bit from connecting with people and from doing the things that you loved. Is that something that you noticed now that you were doing, or what? What do you? What can you tell me about that that time? Um, I think I got very into a very low mood 
and started on antidepressants at that time and then came out of that a few months later, came off the medication, went back down again. So there's been this seesaw of on the medication, off it, on it. And it's, I don't think that's good. Um, I do think the medication, it's fluoxetine, um, it's a small 10 milligram, one tablet a day thing. And just the action of saying, right, this is helping me. This is helping me. Um, has made me feel that I've got some medical support. Um, I've never liked taking antidepressants. At the beginning, I thought it was a sign of weakness, um, emotional weakness. Right. And I've now come to accept that, quite honestly, with all the other stuff that was going on, if I just take this little blue pill <laughs> in the morning when I get up, so what? You know, I'm not shooting up with heroin or, <laughs> you know, I'm not lying in the gutter with a bottle of whiskey. I mean, you know, give yourself a break, Claire. I'm too hard on myself. Yeah, you're yeah. quite a straight shooter and you're somebody who has, you know, very strong values and very strong beliefs. So, you know, you have to be a little bit easier on yourself, especially yeah. when you're in a recovery situation. Yeah recovering from something that was quite dramatic and you want to allow yourself some slack yes <laughs> definitely i'm getting i'm getting definitely getting better at that bill yeah so our our relationship is both friendly but it's kind of an informal coaching situation as well how does yeah. that help you to be uh accountable to somebody because you're accountable to your uh writing buddy uh, you're accountable to uh, Mr. Snuggles because you've got to get up and feed him. How does it help you to be accountable to people? Because you seem to have sourced out some people to mm. make you accountable. Um, I'm not sure whether I go down this route, particularly because I do live alone, or whether it's my nature that I need um, support and encouragement um, and I'm so glad I do have people like yourself, Bill, because you are specially chosen, I'll tell you, because you've been through all this stroke nonsense. I don't think I could be coached by someone who really, really didn't get it. Yeah. Uh, and although our stroke was different and you're younger and, you know, all, all those things, it doesn't matter. You understand the basics of your life being fine one day and the next day it's all to pot. So not a lot of people understand that. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, but maybe a lot of people think, oh, well, she's 69. I mean, her life's over anyway, you know. <laughs> and I think, I don't think so. No, no, no. Um, so I'm fortunate that I have people like yourself and like Dawn and who else is there? My son, of course, and the grandchildren, and my daughter-in-law, they are tremendously supportive. Um, we've uh, not seen the grandkids at the moment. Um, and I'm sure they'll be away camping at Easter. Um, so that'll be another little while I won't see them. Um, but we, we do Zoom. We have um, we have dinners together over Zoom. Yeah, tell me about that because the coronavirus pandemic is changing our movements for a little bit and in order to be safe and keep other people safe and keep the hospital beds free for people who are unwell, we are isolating ourselves, self-isolating. Um, but um, And it's likely that Easter holidays will be cancelled for... Uh, the majority of the people who are traveling, etc. Yeah. But tell me about how you and your family have creatively got together for dinner. Okay. Well, fortunately, my son is an IT techie guy, always has been. That's, that's, that's his world. So years ago, when um, he came out to Australia and I was still in England and Scotland, he set me up with all sorts of webcams and blah, 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 uh, that he showed me how to, to use. And then when I came here in 2011, we added on the, um, the Chrome notebook and, you know, 
So he sets it all up and goes, da-da, off fix, mum, there you go. And I just play with it, um, which is great. So he had already set the, the technology up for us. So what we do is my son um, sends me a Zoom link and he's got his laptop on his dining room table. And um, we've got Ilsa, who's 11, uh, Heather, who's seven, Mum, Joe, and Dad, Stephen. So, and the laptop's here. So I can see all four of them. And then at times, um, I'll say, okay, Ilsa, tell me what's been happening at school. So he'll move the camera around. So it's just me and Ilsa. Now, she loves that because usually the other wee one is interrupting. Grandma, 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 grandma. And so Stephen's saying, one at a time, girls. Grandma can't hear you. We all speak at the one time. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and then <coughs> we all have one-to-one -one chats. I'll chat to Stephen, chat to little Heather. Heather will show me whatever little doll or whatever she's playing with. And then I'll talk to the mum. And um, it takes about half an hour, 40 minutes. But we're all sitting eating and I'm saying, oh, Heather, come on, eat up your spaghetti. <laughs> and she'll go, and the spaghetti's going up and turn up. It's, a, it's hilarious. Um, so and I'm asking them, so what are you eating? And they're saying, well, what, what have you got? And I'm saying, well, tonight I've got bacon and eggs and baked beans and toast. And um, uh, my daughter-in-law say, I'm taking note of what you're eating, Claire. I, I think you had something similar last night. And I'm thinking, oh, damn, I'm being <laughs> monitored. <laughs> so it's all very good natured and I just, I just love it. So that is working very well for us. Um, and I don't honestly think that setting up the webcam and um, the laptop is that difficult um and just the way you did tonight just send me a link they click on it and we're in you know yeah. um so i think a lot more in fact Stephen was at pc world or whatever it's called here the other day and he was getting an extra monitor for their house because his wife's now having to work from home yep. and um i think he got the last monitor in melbourne People were going crazy. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so she's now doing. Um, he set it all up for her. She's now doing. Uh, she's a consultant, a gastroenterologist. So she's doing consultations one to one on webcam. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. And your son still comes around, but he's at the moment. Is he allowed in the house? Are you letting him no. in the house or not? No, no. How does that work? What does he come around for? Um, he'll come to drop me off some shopping um, uh, because Coles just closed their home deliveries recently. I'm sure that it'll open up again, but at the moment they're not doing it. So I sent him a, a list the night before. <clears throat> and when he was doing the family shop, he did another trolley for me. He brought it over, left it in my crate at the front door, and then I went round to my window in my bedroom where Mr. Snuggles was looking out. So he's knocking on the window. So we had a chat. He was chucking through the window. It's absolutely fine. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, that really perked me up, even just hearing his voice and seeing him. Um, you know, and I'm leaving things for the kids in the crate as well. So I put in chocolate bunnies and fluffy bunnies and, you know, daft things like that. And they were thrilled to bits, you know, toys and um, just wee things that I'd got at the op shop. And they, my granddaughter, who's 11, phoned me today and said, oh, Grandma, thank you so much. So I thought, oh, that's very interesting. Um, very grown up of her. But also she really did... Uh, enjoy it and appreciate it and I think oh right this is good <laughs> yes. so you've taken you've taken to this um, lockdown very calmly um, mm. is it your background in 
in the work that you've done in the past or is it has being somebody who's had to navigate uncertain times because of stroke helped you as well like how does it help you to be so calm about this whole situation where a lot of people are not right um interesting question I, when I when I think about my life, it's not really been plain sailing, Bill. <laughs> Nobody's um, life has really, has it? No, no, exactly. Everyone's got a story to tell, and mine's not any better or worse than anyone else's. But I have had to navigate through um, um, having my son Stephen when I was eighteen, uh, my Catholic family going crazy because of it. Not exactly disowning me, but pretty pretty close, um, married his father, divorced his father, married someone else 10 years later who then left me. You know, it, it's it's so opera, really. Um, but each time I've gone down, the next time I don't go down quite as far. So I have built my resilience. Um, and I think it's around... Trusting in myself that I can navigate these situations and whatever else is going to come, Lord knows what it is that's around the corner. Um, but we all have that resilience in us. Um, and the more we employ it, the stronger that muscle gets. Yeah. And it's really about learning from our previous experiences and then applying them to new experiences. It's also about connecting with people that are going to support us, whether it's through Zoom or, um, you know, through other methods or other means so that we can feel like we are, like, like we have somebody to call upon and um, talk about things and talk through things and mm. get an, another opinion about what we're thinking and how we're feeling. And it's really about doing what people always do, which is, find the right people to support you to give you the answers to maybe give you a new idea it's not just about waking up in the morning and expecting yourself to have all the answers and yeah. to do it on your own is it yeah no that's that's very true um and i think that are there are some people in my life some relatives not in this country <laughs> who um I would say have had a pretty easygoing life, um, and they don't they don't get that people who um, are frightened at the moment got a different background to them. Um, they were being called selfish, and and I'm saying, well, I think that's too hard. People are reacting in different ways for different reasons. We've all got different backgrounds. Uh, no, let's let's not judge each other. You know, um, let's just see what we can do to encourage and and acknowledge. Right, you're finding that hard. I'm sorry to hear that. What can I do to help you? So, you know, something along those lines. Instead of saying, as some of my family members do, "Oh, it's ridiculous." <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm quite different from my family in that respect, I'm glad to see. <laughs> yeah. I still want to keep in touch with them, obviously. Yeah, yeah. It's okay for them to be different, for them to have their own opinions. And um, it's okay for us to run our own race, isn't it? Yeah. I Getting to know you and every time I'm around you, you're always smiling and laughing at stuff. <laughs> Is that a mechanism that helps? Is it something that you've always done? Like, how is it that you're always able to find something to laugh at? I don't know. Um, uh, maybe I just look in the mirror. That gives me a good laugh. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think, who's that old woman? <laughs> how did that happen? I really don't know how I got to this age. This is a complete surprise to me. Um, so that, that does make me laugh. I look in the mirror and I think, what? Oh, right, okay. Don't look any longer. That's fine. <laughs> um, so it's just a disposition, I suppose, that is very helpful. Yeah. That doesn't mean to say that I don't have down times and times when 
I'm thinking, oh, damn this, you know, I can't be doing with this any longer. And then I think, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. You've been through worse than this and God knows what's coming next. So you better, better gather your courage, Claire, and step up. Yeah. So 70 is nearly here. It's, you're going to be 70 soon. What's in store for your 70th or your seventh decade? What are your short-term and long-term plans? Okay. By the time I'm 70, I will have published my second book. I've got a chapter book, if you know what that is, um, already published. A yeah, a chapter, chapter book where, where you've written a chapter and another number, a few, few, few more people have written their own chapter. Yeah, so that's been good. I really enjoyed doing that. And now I'm working on my own book, which is called The Stroke Warrior. Um, and yeah, that's what Don's helping me with. And that will be published by the end of 2020. I've got a publisher in the wings. She's waiting. She, but damn it, she needs the manuscript. <laughs> yeah, can't publish it without a manuscript. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's a very solid thing that I can um, work towards and enjoy. Um, I mean, they say that uh, writing about these kind of life experiences it's very cathartic for us yeah. um, and we can work through a lot of the emotions. But I'm hoping that it'll also um, give some people who are either friends or relatives of a stroke survivor or a strokey, as I like to call them, um, some laughs, some different ways of looking at things and some maybe new or novel um, uh, ideas, techniques that maybe they haven't thought of. You know, all I can say is these things work for me. Pick and choose anything that you, you fancy. What I'd like to know is if somebody wanted to get in touch with you because they loved hearing what you had to say or they wanted to get a pre-ordered copy of your book or something like that, how mm -hmm. would they do that? What's the best way? My um, business website is <clears throat> Claire, C L A R E, there's no I in Claire, C L A R E dot Caulfield, C O double -S, S for Freddie, I E L D at Clarity in Your Life, all one word, all lowercase, dot com. So Claire dot Caulfield at Clarity in Your Life dot com. Yeah. Claire at Clarity in Your Life dot com. Okay, lovely. Yep. Uh, so now you're, you've previously also been a coach and you're recently picked up a new client. Now, without revealing too much about your new client or any of those things, what type of coaching are you supporting that person with? Okay. Now, this client came to me because I'd left copies of that chapter book in the local cafe. And she opened it up and she read my chapter and I put my business card inside with my email and phone number. So she phoned me up and said, oh, just been reading your chapter. Um, really enjoyed reading it. Um, would you be my coach? And I said, oh, that sounds terrific. You know, what is it that you'd like to be coached about? And she said, well, I'm in my early 40s. My Daughter has gone to school full time now. Um, not being on, getting on that great with my husband for a couple of years, and I'm thinking, oh, things are changing around me. Should I start and make some big changes? <laughs> and you're somebody that definitely has some <laughs> background in that type of thing, don't you? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, the thing is that I never give advice. I never tell people what to do. Um, they come up with the, their own range of solutions. And then they pick what is best for them. And I say, that's what you're wanting to, to do. I'll support you in that, whatever it is. So 
um, I, I never, um, I never make decisions for clients ever. Um, it's a supportive and encouraging role, and a listening role. I'm good at listening. Yeah. We have actually, although I've talked <laughs> like a crazy person for the last hour. Um, so, although we were meeting each other here at my home for the coaching sessions, we're now going to do it over Skype. So easy. Yeah, it's a great solution, and that's yeah. one of the beautiful things about coaching online. You don't need to be in the same country, the same state, or the same room as that person. You can just coach and offer really good value to people wherever they are. Yeah. Claire, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's always fun to connect with you, have a coffee with you, see you in person, give you a hug. We <laughs> can't do that for the time being, but um, I have just as much fun on Zoom as I do in person. Oh, good. Well, I love talking to you too, Bill. That was really nice. Thank you. And all the best on your recovery. I look forward to the book um, being finished and uh, I look forward to writing, uh, writing the forward in that for you. Discover how to support your recovery after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com.